Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back. We got another episode of Strange Happenings. I'm your host, Mikey. And today we have a special guest co-host in the house, creative director and host of the What You Don't Hear podcast, Ross Tyson. Everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome, Ross. Ladies and gents. Welcome back, I should say. I am very stoked to be Episode back. 10, yes. dude. Yes, How episode 10, and now we're bringing it back around. <laughs> I'm you excited. You our third guest in studio. Second, yeah, maybe? Really? Second I in studio. That part. Yeah. See, when I came here, I was like, everything's up and running so well. I'm like, yeah, you've oh, done was millions like of these. Like, yeah, and, then, yeah, and then you guys were like, no, this is just starting. We're just yeah. getting this operation up and going. So, Well, it did take months to kind of it, – it, it was very like the wizard there in Master Control, which, by the way, still we got Stoner the loner in Master Control, everybody. Much love to him. He's uh, double-time duding audio and video tonight. Yeah. So – Hey, I see everybody out there watching live. Guys, thank you so much for supporting the show. We got a great show tonight for you. Some awesome articles. You know, it's uh it's been a kind of a lonely week in here. Stoner's been out working gigs, Bubs in North Carolina. I've been kind of down here by myself just like yeah, hanging out that, like where's that everybody? Makes sense. At? Well, when nothing lonely. else is going on, you know to call Ross. So yeah. that's <laughs> you like, got all reliable. I need to call Ross. We haven't <laughs> kicked it in a while. We haven't hung out in a yes, while. This is true. And what better way to kick it in hang out rather than talk about a bunch of weird and spooky stuff going on around the world right exactly and you have been on our list to get you back in because there's some unfinished business i think that we had from up episode 10 yeah that uh but you know we're we're just right around you're just right down the street basically so this is true we got to make that happen we just keep getting introduced to so many people which is now we're at the point though we're starting to bring Guests that we had on earlier back on to revisit. You've passed enough time. Yes. Like I've been doing that with what you don't hear a little bit. We're yeah. like, I'm I'm you know, four years into doing it yep. and over a hundred episodes. So I'm like, yeah, there can be some people that come back on at this point. Like, so right. yeah, totally with you. Yep. Yep. But uh, you guys can follow Ross on Instagram. You can follow the podcast. You're on all the social medias, Ross. I am aware. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm around. I might yeah. not love being around on all those social media platforms. You do but stuff, as dang they it, say. I am. <laughs> yeah. You're always posting. Your reels are always top notch. Your production quality is top notch. I, I need uh, to hear that. So it yeah, feels it, like there's a it, reason to keep killing. up with the, with the system and the machine. But, yeah, you know, I feel it. I but feel I love it. it. So, yeah. Uh, but guys, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Got to hit that notification bell. Uh, appreciate everybody out there listening on Spotify, Apple, and everywhere else. Uh, keep those five star ratings coming. We've had some four. It's okay. I'm not mad. All right. Wait, I'm not all mad, right, guys. <laughs> what are we doing here? What's the real reason for a four? I mean, honestly, <laughs> you're either just gonna give it a five you, or a one. I don't know, know why anything is? in between. Why would you? That's like I like it, but not. not I don't love it. I'm speaking directly to uh, those folks. <laughs> Bub and I are actively trying to not talk over each other. Okay, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're okay. not. We're trying to get better at not interrupting the. But we get excited. You know, we. This yeah. is, a, you know, a f- whatever forty year long habit that we have to break because that's just how <laughs> we talk to each other. Right. In general, so all you four star people, that is the <laughs> the main comment that we receive. Is, well, I'm going to try in this episode <laughs> to not talk over you very much, so we can oh, gain that God, star back. Please maybe. do, please do talk over me. I need <laughs> shut up every now and then. Uh, guys, we have an awesome episode. We can hop right into it. Uh, we had an. Uh, by the way, all you guys that were uh, a part of Monday's premiere with uh, Karen Wilkinson, alien Ab- abductee phenomenon, really uh, was the episode, okay. and she's an experiencer abductee since she was a child. We go through this, lo- and at the end, it's like Karen's not a crazy person. That's awesome. She's a very just normal you know she's okay. a mother she's a grandmother but you know she's out there she wrote a book out there telling her truth so everybody that was uh, that was in and has listened to that watched that episode thank you so much thanks to karen um but uh you know couldn't have been more happy with uh the excitement of the chat that's uh, awesome during that episode yeah so. i missed that one so that's one that i'm going to dive back it's, in the archives and good. uncover because that yeah that sounds very cool yeah like that's it's, it's strange. Yeah. We'll, we'll put it that way. Uh, but, hey, let's hop right in tonight, uh, everybody. Our first article tonight is from Science Alert, written by Carly Casella. Okay? And this is one of my favorite ancient civilizations, ancient sites, whatever you want to say, is uh, Gunung Padang. Okay? This is a okay. 
place that I heard about very long time ago. I mean, it had to be in 2004 or five, the beginning of YouTube, really, um, is, yeah. is I saw a video about Ganong Pong, and, okay. it's, and it's also uh, Graham Hancock's written about it. It's been on, like, early episodes of Ancient Aliens. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it was on Ancient Aliens, like, whoa, this is awesome. And so yeah. they've actually covered it a whole bunch of times on okay. Ancient Aliens. Um, you know, the verdict's still out if, if all these sites were built by I don't think they were. I just think that people were super, super advanced. Yeah. And we didn't really need. Maybe they came down and helped Guided us along. some things along sure. maybe or said, hey, here's how you use a couple but different I think things humans, for you. But right. I think human beings built these advanced yeah. sites. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but, you know, this has gained a lot of attention on that show. So what was the original concept of, like, why, why did it get attention originally? Like, was it just because it was an ancient site, or was there something, well, what was special <clears throat> about it? Yeah, so the, this kind of covered a little bit, but the people there have always called this a sacred mountain. Okay. And so as these stories have kind of come to the city, there's archaeologists, geologists from Java, that have come there <clears throat> over the years of just, you know, these stories that these local people would tell mm-hmm. about this sacred hill that just looks like it was obliterated by a nuclear bomb. Yeah. You know, and they go up there, they pray, they, the indigenous people, the villagers, <clears throat> for, you know, all of their tradition, this has been a sacred place. So, you know, it's in controversy because it's so old, it just looks like, a bunch of jagged rocks from, let's say, uh, right. vol- and it's on top of, vol- of a volcano. Okay. So this indig- indigenous, indigenous rock that's coming up that's just blasting out, and it's just naturally has made these kind of terraces and right-angle megalithic stones. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's so messed up that it, it's hard. There's not really, you can see the structure. Here's, mm-hmm. you know, the photo, but... Um, it's highly, highly debated up until recently this paper, which is multidisciplinary paper that we're going to talk about, um, and that's the Geoarchaeological Prospecting of Ganong Palang, Buried Prehistoric Pyramid in West Java, Indonesia. And this is Wiley Online Library. We'll have the link to the actual – I know some of you chasing mound builders, you would probably go out and read this whole – the whole actual paper, um, and I plan to, to breeze through it too because what I like is like 10 different scientists, archaeologists, geologists, all these different multidisciplinary. You don't have that here in the U.S. Yeah. You have archaeologists fighting with geologists, especially in Egypt. Right. You know, they, they don't, engineers are, you know, they're kind of, their work's like, oh, well, that's, that, you know, engineers, geologists. Well, you're not an archaeologist. Mm-hmm. So, so that's why these are kind of hotly debated. So but now this paper, um, and it's a giant underground pyramid like hidden beneath a hillside in Indonesia, far outdates Stonehenge or the Giza pyramids. And according to a new paper, which may come to rival the oldest megalithic structures ever built by human beings. And again... This is, so like I said, it's an island west of Java. Yeah. So Java, you know, all that area is just a huge volcanic. Like there's a super volcano underneath all of those, which is, again, a big reason why they think this is natural. Mm-hmm. Some people debate that it's, that it's just the, a volcano <clears throat> that exploded, and that's the way these rocks came out of the earth, and then right. they solidified. Um, so the structure is sacred to the locals, and it's known as... Punden Baranadak. Okay. And it means stepped pyramid. Interesting. So yeah. there you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> it's a terrace structure which looks absolutely designed. Uh, Ganung Padang is potentially the oldest pyramidal structure in the world, but atop an extinct volcano before the dawn of agricultural civilization as we know it. Mm. Uh, controversy whether it's man made or even a pyramid at all. And the controversy. Uh, I think is going to start getting broken. I did read an article. I didn't put it in the links and try to cover it because, <clears throat> but uh, another article was written about two months after this paper came out on, okay. uh, I believe it was the guardian, but they really went hard on, on the, the paper. Like there's still people like pushing back on this, this paper comes out and they're like, Hey, this is a man-made structure and we'll get into that. Yeah. But 
you know, you still have the, the mainstream academia of whatever universities that are pushing back through the media, calling out, you know, that's still more work to be done. The evidence isn't out. You know, it doesn't convince them. This paper is yeah. not convinced, even though you have 10 really well-rounded, multidisciplinary guys, scientists that are looking at this and... and that's their conclusion. Do you think that comes from In because this age. is happening a lot recently like, of just like yeah. more and more hidden structures and all that sort of stuff. Like there was something uncovered in the Amazon that they were yeah. doing the ground scans. Yeah. They just found like a whole oh, civilization, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. Do you think that the pushback is more on the side of no, because this changes so much of what we understand about history? We don't even want to accept they can't keep it. Up. Like they, we just don't even know how to almost comprehend. Like, no, this would this would mean that, you know, that that we're we were advanced thousands of years before this, right. and we're over. Here. Like, is that where you think the the pushback comes yeah, from? It's just like we're trying I to think, change too much. Yeah, I think it's just a lot of like you would have to rewrite, literally rewrite the history books, because mm -hmm. they're saying that there's nothing advanced before the ice during the ice age, before the you know the mythical. But it's not mythical. It's the flood, the great flood. Yeah. You yeah. know, the more and more the um, younger Dryas impact theory and that a meteor, a comet hit the ice shelf and just flooded North America, flooded mm -hmm. Northern Europe. And, you know, we have legends of the flood all over the world. And so that flood that there's no way that these civilizations could have gotten that advanced during the Ice Age. Mm -hmm. But they were all south of the glacier in yeah. South America. Yep. That's when you have the Peruvian and the Yucatan, the Mayans, where they got the ice never reached there. Mm -hmm. So those cultures could have advanced for yeah. millennia and yeah. millennia and millennia. Um, and so, you know, the timelines are just they really want to hold on to it's, this yeah, established and, and I, yeah, timeline. I, I get it, but to me, I'm, all, I'm just like, it's so much more fun to rewrite the timeline. It's not bad. It's so much cooler to find new information and then be like, wow, we did, actually, it's this not was 20,000 years before, actually. Yes. Like, that's fascinating. Sure. And, of course, I know, you know we're two people sitting here on a podcast all about strange and fascinating yeah. things, so I get and that we're, we're going to say scientists. that. We're not scientists. We're not. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, speak for yourself, pal. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, I got a PhD in all science. That's I what the label says. I got a PhD in bro. <laughs> That's about all. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, of course it's easy for us to be like, this is so cool, and you know, there's always going to be someone somewhere who yeah doesn't like the cool thing and wants that to to not change right. what they already understand or believe because right. it's ultimately probably easier to to mm -hmm. sit and be like, no, 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 if it's just this, we don't have to think about it anymore. When, but I think yeah. the, the more fascinating thing, that's always more fun to dig into right. of, of learning something new and be like, wow, this is different than what we thought it was. And then that's why I love, you know, not the trail off here, but I love any, any like lost civilization ideas um, or great resets. Like I love mm -hmm. the idea of civilization resets and stuff. Oh, yeah. I'm like, ooh, man, like, you know, because more and more, happened. yes, more and more keeps popping up and there's more information where people are like, hey, there, there's something, you know, hey, in this this mountainside fell off and layers they into this here. mountain, it's now revealing yeah. a, a whole building, a whole yeah. old civilization that we had no idea, mm -hmm. no comprehension that was there, yet was buried under years and years worth of ground. So what does that mean? There, there's an entire lost civilization. What did they do? How long were they? Like, yeah, That's all that how stuff. they discovered the Bosnian pyramids, what you just said. The yeah. Bosnian pyramids, people don't think those are actual ancient structures giant pyramids in bosnia there's yeah. three of them actually they're, mm -hmm. they're these huge mountains we, we covered a while back but they're, they're so old that there's literally six or seven feet of dirt mm -hmm. over top of this thing if you've ever seen old pictures of teotihuacan this is a great example when they stumbled upon that and photographed it in the 1800s by the time you know people from england and in the that, that reached it, mm -hmm. it was, it looked like a hill. There yeah. were trees growing on, like we had the mounds here in Ohio. Yeah. You know, there's trees, go over Shrung Mound, it's, there's trees sticking out of it, mm -hmm. and it's just a pile of dirt. Yep. Well, that's what Teotihuacan looked like, and that's what Gurung Padang looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what um, Bosnian pyramids, if they're real, but I mean, it shows that there's roads around the pyramid, there's yeah. tunnels that go into the mountain that have stone. You know, hallways. Mm -hmm. uh, the dude's a little kooky. Yeah, there you go, Stern. <coughs> um, 
Yeah, I can scroll down to that too. Um, so that is basically the structure of it here. Yeah. And what we're looking at is just a section. You know, that's the the hilltop that you saw in the in the, you know, so all the way down. You know, yep. this thing, and we'll get to that. But this thing is so ancient that I think it, like a lot like Gobekli Tepe, which is a series of hills that mm -hmm. were covered up over the years of, and they just keep building these structures and then burying it and then building another yeah. one and then yeah. burying it. And that kind of seems like what they've done since. Oh, I don't know. Sixteen thousand BC is what they're saying. Wow. Is the the bottom level? <clears throat> so the the terraces with to with topsoil, and the yellow part here is mostly buried one to three meters deep, and then here on the left, this chart, <clears throat> um, they call it the Echo Two on T five, and this cross section, and you, you can clearly see different layers. Uh, unit four, yeah. unit three, unit two. Um, and basically there's three levels and then the centerpiece, which was probably the oldest part, that, mm -hmm. that brown kind of oval plate, uh, there in the center. So they come along and they just, it was kind of a hill, yep. sacred hill. And then they build over that and it becomes more stone. Mm -hmm. And then somebody comes along and builds an even more rad structure in stone around that. And that's just happening over thousands and thousands of years yeah where there might be a thousand years in between where there's nobody coming here it's right. falling out of disrepair there's nobody hanging out another culture comes up yep and i think that's what happened you know jeff wilson said that serpent mound was at least built that there was mounds there around the ice age so before okay. the you know, like around that younger driest impact part hmm. uh part of history okay and so there was people there they found artifacts from people from way back then now the serpent wasn't there yeah nobody had built serpent mount but that area was something mm -hmm. back in those times too yep so that, they just keep coming yeah you know, rebuild something come along reconstruct it mm -hmm. you know uh, <clears throat> you know somebody fixed up our back porch and so when the people that built our home, you know, did they build that porch? No, they added on. They reconstructed. Right. The people that built our porch didn't build our house. Yep. So that's the kind of way I look at it. Is, yeah. Well, and, that, and that's the thing is uh, when you explain it like that, most people would be like, oh, yes, of course. We, we tear down buildings. We rebuild them and whatever. And it's like, well, that same thing could have been ha – absolutely would be happening it's for like, thousands and thousands like of years. Carbon dated <laughs> a piece of plywood in my ground for 2023. When my porch was built, so the, my house was built in 2023. Right. No. Right. Right. My porch yep, was yep. built in 2023. Exactly. My house was built in 1972. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so uh, let me go back to my notes here. But these photographs are amazing. Like yeah, they're just very so cool. cool. Um, so the name also means Gudung Panung translates to Mountain of Enlightenment. Okay. So. <sighs> You got to give them credit. Uh, so it suggests, this paper suggests that it's meticulously sculpted, that the natural hill of lava into a core of a pyramid-like structure long ago. So they built it into the lava core, which is that, that centerpiece there mm -hmm. uh, in the diagram. Uh, according to the new data from scientists in Indonesia, its interior could also very well be hiding large open chambers filled with unknowns. Now see that's when you that's when you Hello. get me. any anything with large open chambers uh, <laughs> potentially hidden inside them dun, with any dun, potential dun, I, I'm absolutely dun, dun, dun. it is it is an absolute <laughs> fascination of mine anything yeah. hidden within somewhere like if you're ever just in yeah. a house oh. and you find a secret passageway we secret please doors, call trap me. doors my buddy my buddy I'm not going to say his name on air our buddy bought a house in Tip City that's where Abbott Foods headquarters is huge corporation and the CEOs of Abbott, they own that house. So what they had was all these weird hidden rooms. Oh, that's my and dream. And he, he saw that house. It's mine. I think he even paid just for that secret, 
that secret room. It's like a bookshelf. Yeah. A uh, secret passageway. Then he has another one. I think there's another one in the, somewhere else. Man. Yeah. Anytime. Bro. Yeah. I'm, whether it's ancient buildings like this or, or just an old house from the 70s where there's like a secret yeah. closet that was built over. Oh, yeah. I'm like, take me there. I want to know. Yeah. I want to find the secret set of stairs that right. leads further down through the basement that we didn't know went further. Like, the original constitutions down there. Or an, something. Abs- <laughs> an absolute dream of mine. Take me on a national treasure oh. adventure anytime. Oh, God. So these radiocarbon dates are, are, like I was saying earlier, back sometime before the glass glacial period, more than 16,000 years before the present and possibly as far back as 20, 27,000 years ago. Gobekli Tepe, which is a massive stone assembly present-day Turkey, is currently considered to be the oldest known megalithic structure in the world. It dates back to 11,000 years. So this is blowing yeah. away Gobekli Tepe. Uh, Between 2011 and 2015, a team of archaeologists, geologists, and geophysicists led by geologist Danny Hillman. Shout out to Danny Hillman. Boy, I wish Bob was here to pronounce this guy's last name. Uh, Nata Wadijaja. Got it. Yep. Okay. Was that good? I believe I tried. At Indonesia's National Research and Innovation Agency, used a variety of techniques such as core drilling around penetrating radar, uh, GPR, and subsurface imaging. Uh, Nata Wadijija and colleagues suggest that Gurung Padang was built in a complex and in st- sophisticated stages. The deepest part, which is less than 30 meters down, uh, researchers think that its core is part of the structure was probably built between 25,000 and 14,000 BCE. According to the paper, construction started again around 7,900 to 6,100 BC. Sumer's just getting going, bro. Wow. Sumer's just getting going. That's like the, wild. they're on a parallel trip. Mm-hmm. There's only supposed to be a major civilization happening in Sumer around. That's where the sprouting of all of our civilization, modern civilization that comes from, you know, the Egypt, it comes from Greek and the Romans and then all the way. That's where we track our Western civilization mm-hmm. is back. And there's not supposed to be anything before that. And then they found Gobekli Tepe. Sumer was supposed to be the beginning. How is it that in Indonesia, there's a culture that's building pyramids too mm-hmm. and building massively advanced structures as well. Mm -hmm. So are there places all over the world that were doing this? Yeah. Throughout? It's not just, hey, this one place started everything. No! That's not silly. We learned about that in in high school. 100%. It's always, this was a crazy cool place with pyramids, this was a crazy cool place with a whatever, and then that was just it. That's all that existed. And then all of a sudden, it's just Ohio. Yeah. Like, it's just that, and then and then we're here in Ohio. Like, that's there's, that's the history. And there was a civil right. war also at one point. Oh, yeah. That's it. Dude. Just throw that in there. American history, it was never, it's, I I can enjoy it, but it's it was never, when, when I took a <clears throat> world cultures class senior year, that's when I got the bug for ancient, so we learned about the Maya, we learned, and we had an awesome teacher. Mm-hmm. He was our football coach, too. He's just fun, energetic dude, liked to learn, and I just... Paid attention in class. Yeah, well, well it when was you're, weird when you're learning about something <laughs> other than the same exact thing you learned about last year in history class. Like yeah. that's yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, you know we we had all the guys from uh, I don't know if your school had this, but there's guys that uh, go to these trade programs mm-hmm. and then half the day they go to work. Yeah, yeah. So they go to like you know uh, car mechanic. Uh, you know, there's d- different uh, classes for, you know, once you, you're not going to go to college, so you, mm-hmm. you're learning a trade. And those guys got to just go to work, so they had to just take the easy, co- the, whatever the easiest course was. And we had all those dudes in that class, and we had a ball. That's we amazing. just laughed yeah. all the time, screwed around so bad. Uh, two of my good buddies were in that class, but it was just fun. Mm-hmm. We got to go to the Renaissance Fair on a field trip. That's First time I ever went to the Ren Fair here in Ohio. Okay. By the way, if anybody's, if you guys have not been to the Renaissance Fair in Southern Ohio, you I haven't yet. Go. I almost went this past fall, and then I wasn't able to make it. You should totally go. Yep. I it's, want to. it's amazing. Okay, we're getting sidetracked here. Um, so further building work took place between 6,000 and 5,500 BC. The final architects of the pyramid around, arrived around 2,000 to 1,100 BCE. So you're looking at Greek 
mm-hmm. like early Greek civilization, actually. Like yeah. that's thousand, you know, fifteen hundred years before the Romans. Um, when researchers probed the interior of the hillside using seismic waves, they found evidence of hidden cavities and chambers, some of fifteen meters long with ceilings ten meters high. Unclear whether these were constructed by humans. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it is volcanic. You know, those yeah, volcanic yeah. chambers, they can create pretty weird caves, but not like very structured dimensions. They're probably, I don't know. Right. I'm not a geologist, but. I also am a geologist, though, as long with the scientists that I said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you got multiple PhDs. I, I do. Yeah. yeah. I forgot all my name tags on my car, though. But That's all good. We don't, uh, we don't check them at the door. Yeah, good. So this study exemplifies how a comprehensive approach in integrating archaeological, geological, and geophysical methods can uncover, imagine that, can uncover hidden and vast ancient structures. Dude, that's what I've been saying for so long. Why don't people just get together and figure out things? Not (laughs) this guy's fighting this guy. You know, Dr. Robert Schott got so much shit when he dated the Sphinx to at least 12,600 years. Because that was when the, the there was water and floods coming into the Giza pyramid, and mm-hmm. on the outskirts of the uh, Sphinx enclosure, it, it's water erosion. Yeah, it's not wind erosion; it's water. But guess what? There had to be a ton of water pouring into that Sphinx enclosure. Robert Shock's like, I don't care what your you know timeline says. Mm-hmm. The own, geologically, these things could not be made. Unless there was tons of water pouring into this because the Sphinx is carved from the bedrock. So imagine a flat top, sur- you're carving down into it yeah. and carving a negative space mm-hmm. to create, which was originally a lion because it was literally directed, uh, aligned with Leo mm, around okay. 12,500 years ago, too, is when he would have been pointing at the Leo constellation. So that's. Th- but what he never, he, he's a geologist. Yeah. Dr. Robert Schock got brutalized in the press in the 90s. I mean, just, and now all these things are coming out that it's not really that, to say that the Sphinx is that yeah. old, it's you not that far fetched. You would assume at some point we would learn, but I think everyone, yeah. uh, everyone loves that whole ego thing oh, yeah. and really wants their way to be, to be right. Yeah. Isn't, wasn't that a thing with uh, washing hands? Wasn't that you know that story? I don't, I don't know any of the details of oh, it, so I'm gonna hear this. I'm gonna be that person on a podcast who just says a story. <laughs> yeah. it's like, you heard about with this? no fact check. Yeah, with <laughs> zero fact. So, folks, this is why I'm not always on this show because I have no <laughs> factual information. <laughs> I just heard this somewhere. Um, but apparently, a, a story about some doctor at one point in time somewhere uh, they had this high death rate at their location. He suggested. Hey, what if it has to do with us washing our hands because we're going from person to person, spreading all of these things called germs around? Yeah. What if we started washing our hands and like, and you know, they were like, "That's you're insane. That's stupid." (laughs) But they started doing it. Oh yeah. Mortality rates. Then everything switched. Everything was fine. Louis Pasteur. And then everyone was like, "No, this guy's insane." Yeah. Sent him to an insane asylum. Yeah. Got rid of him. I don't know if that was Louis Pasteur, but yes. Yeah. And then 100%. and then they flipped everything back, and they were like, "What's this washing hands thing? We're yeah. not doing this." Yep. And then it goes back, and then everyone starts dying again. Yeah. No one believed Louis Pasteur, and he's like, "There's these little creatures that live inside you that make you sick," and they're like, "Oh, whatever, Louis, crazy old Louis." He's like you're an idiot. Yeah. And then he won yeah. the Nobel Peace Prize. Mm-hmm. Hey, Burton, thank you so much, dude. Super chat, appreciate that. When do you drop those hats in the merch store? Well, the thing is is that we have to create something in our Shopify portal to then put them, and I don't know how to do that. So that's something that uh, if you if you want a hat, hit me up. Guys, if you want any of the, the new merch, the new T-shirts, we have purple, uh, the teal, gray, and the black shirts, and then we have the hoodies. Uh, that are charcoal, gray, and blue with a different design. So if you guys want any of those, just hit me up. All right, we'll we'll, we'll work it out. Um, you know, we'll we'll hook it up. Um, but yeah, appreciate you, Bertie. Much love, brother. Much love. Um, but uh, yeah, what were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Probably the next article, I think. How yeah, about that? Yeah, what do you absolutely. think, Mike? We, we yeah, think talk about well, the next fire. article, I think. I did see. Uh, I did see. You guys should go follow Necro on Instagram, and I also saw Cryptids of the Corn in there. Uh, local legends, go check out those guys' show. 
um, go check out their content, everybody. I know a lot of you guys are, are, are kind of uh, on point to everything that's happened. You guys listen to a lot of podcasts, uh, a lot of different, you know, they're getting information from a lot of different places. I'm learning mm-hmm. a lot of things on our Discord channel. Yeah. Uh, from, yeah. You know, that's opened up a lot of cool conversations, but a lot of these guys are well-informed, smart, smart folks. Smarter uh, than me who just says a story on yeah. a podcast <laughs> that he heard one place. <laughs> Probably in a movie somewhere, oh. so don't listen to me. Oh, man. Uh, this is cool. So shout out to John Thorne, our buddy here in town. It's a DP. Uh, he actually sent me this. Stoner independently put this in the Strange Happenings links. I completely forgot that uh, we were on a gig, and Thorne texts me uh, that uh, the link for this Reddit post, while out hunting with the dog, I checked her GPS location, and boy, was I surprised when I think I found an undocumented serpent mound in the Waynesville area. Literally, when you sent me this earlier and I saw this picture, I was like, this is the coolest thing that right? could happen to anybody right. on a walk with your dog. Like, Dude, that is, I walk it is my such dog a cool all the time. And you, well, you need to start taking more drone shots I, when I, you do because I know. you yeah. never know what you're walking well, by. Because this is, I mean, that's insane. Doesn't it look like it? Oh, I it mean, does. Exactly like it. 100%. I sent this to Jeffrey Wilson. Jeffrey, if you're out there, uh, I, 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 I don't know if you've responded, but I'd love to get Jeffrey's take on this. Um, I'm sure somebody's posted this in the Friends of the Serpent Mountain group. Um, but, you know, I actually tried to track this guy down today and reach out. Yeah. Um, just to, if he knows who the property owner is, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I don't think it's uncouth to, you know, ask him if we can come and, and <clears throat> hey, you know, we'll, we don't have to disclose the location by any means. Or, yeah, yeah, uh, let's not make it a I think huge tourist destination. it's worth documenting. Mm-hmm. And getting some photographs, you know, high quality photos from, with the drone, um, <clears throat> walking around out there. I mean, the I, my iPhone has lidar on it. We can walk out through with a stick and and get a map of it. That's cool. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're gonna look into this. But this is this. Uh, and the guy, I forget. I thought I wrote down who posted this. But shout out to the poster of this of this Reddit post. Just an interesting image. I mean, it sure does look like it. It 100% looks like it. Like, absolutely looks like it. There's no spiral, it seems, on the tail, but, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just, uh, you know what it looks like is more like this uh, Tibetan symbol for, for, like, the medical, the caduceus, uh, which we talked about a little bit with our buddy VJ. But that's kind of what it looks like, because it's more of a strip. Serpent Mound curls like this. Yeah, it this kind one's of curls just kind around. of a... It does feel like it's more of a straight top-to-bottom symbol. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it'd be interesting to run that through that area through one of those astronomical um, virtual calendars. I don't know if you ever played with uh-uh. one of those. I haven't. Yeah, you can, like, basically travel in time. It'll predict where the sun is going to rise. Okay. Like 20. You can set the date. To like 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you can see where the moon's going to rise, where the sun's going to rise. Hmm. Um, but, you know, you could plug that location and see if there's like any alignments yeah. happening. That's cool. Yeah. No, that 100%. That, again, that but would be a. It's on private property. We yeah. don't want to blow up the spot. You got to be very respectful. 100%. You don't want, you know, people knocking on their door and Ohio History Connection showing up with. You know, some unsolicited dig happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, but yeah. Yeah. So, very cool. Thought that was worth sharing. Uh, this next article, sensory stimulation detoxifies the Alzheimer's brain. Uh, we were talking about sound a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, was that before we went live? Or I think it was, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. <laughs> we got into a really deep conversation before we went live. You always got to have a podcast yeah. conversation before you're recording the podcast. <laughs> yeah. It always happens. You yeah. always do, too. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, and this is from Spectrum. And uh, so sensory stimulation, it's 40 hertz sound and light oscillations activate the brain's waste disposal function. Um, and... It's a flicker of light and a buzz of sound that may hold the key to combating Alzheimer's. It's a new study in mice that offers insights into how the unconventional therapy might work in humans. These non-invasive brain stimulation technology features an audiovisual disco of rhythmic 40 hertz stimuli designated, uh, designed to boost brain health by enhancing neural activity at the same gamma frequency. 
gamma rays, I don't understand what that means, Mm -mm. but boy, does it come up a lot. Yeah. These gamma hertz, gamma rays, like there's this gamma frequency that's just, that's what your brain, I think, resonates on. Mm -hmm. Like your brain outputs that hertz. Yeah. Is this gamma. And, uh, you know, Spotify has all these different, you know, binaural beats. Mm-hmm. There's gamma hertz. There's all, I don't I don't know what any I don't means. I, I am a scientist, but I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, you're not a sound scientist. Yeah, I didn't say that. I'm working <laughs> on that one though. <laughs> um, so it, it's administered for an hour each day through an integrated headset or display panel. And at home therapy has shown promise in early clinical trials. And people with various stages of Alzheimer's, it has been associated with uh, preserved brain volume. I guess that's your fluid. In your, okay. your brain matter, and you know, as you you get older, that stuff starts to deteriorate. Yeah, um, that's so wild, weird, right? Um, strengthened connectivity between neurons, improved mental functioning, and more restful sleep, and among other benefits. So a lot going on here. A medical hmm. device startup called Conjunto Therapeutics is currently evaluating the sensory therapy in a large randomized trial of people with mild to moderate Alzheimer's. Meanwhile, the company's academic co-founder, neuroscientist Li Hyo Tsai, and a neuroengineer, Ed Boyden, much, much simpler name, uh, both at the uh, MIT and continue to stress how 40 hertz sync sessions induce beneficial changes in mouse models. This rhythmic remedy aids in the removal of beta amyloid, which is a sticky protein that clumps together in your brain. So how this, how that gunkiness happens? Yeah. Who, re- how, how does your brain just gunk up? Like sometimes you feel foggy. Maybe there's actual like gunk in your brain. Yeah, I mean. That's yeah. making that happen. Um, and so basically... So how does the 40 hertz therapy work? The 40 hertz therapy helps to bring more cerebral uh, spinal fluid into the brain. The neural juices slosh around. They accumulate beta amyloid gunk and flow out through specialized waste removal channels before eventually getting eliminated through the body's excretory pathways. I like so, that gunk is a scientific term here yeah, in this, in but this article. but your brain's doing that. Yeah. They're not in there removing no, it. No, no. Your brain just is getting rid of it and yep. he's That's and just wild. pooping it out of your brain. <laughs> you know, I, like, I poop a lot of things out of my brain pretty often. <laughs> that is uh, insane, though. Isn't it? Um, How much information are they getting from the mice that they're testing on here? It's, I do have that. They Do do they do a test on a, mi- on a mouse and they're like, do you remember three yeah, years ago? And yeah, then they're like, the mouse doesn't say yeah. anything. They're like, oh, my God, we're not there yet. They're probably just measuring the gunk. The, I guess. A gunk you know? measurement. Yes. Yeah. Yes, of course. And then the mouse is, you know, a little bit sharper. He's, that makes, yes. You know, a little bit uh, with it. That with makes the sense. ladies. Who knows? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what are you? They're asking the mouse. They're like, what do you remember? And he's like, there used to be this cat called Tom <laughs> years ago. And they're like, yeah. wow, we're really breaking through to him. Yep. This is insane. Yeah. And all I can do is joke about it because I'm not smart enough to comprehend. Oh, yeah. What's good. This is insane. Yeah. Like, this is wild. So they're going to make this device available for purchase. Was blew my mind. Already? Eventually. What, so they got to go. It? They got to go through. Think about that. Yeah. yeah. Like these. There's these big pharmaceutical tech companies that are emerging. And we're going to we have an article about, you know, psychedelic medicine that just got approved recently, which that uh, I can't wait med. to get into that. Yeah, one. That we'll one talk to very cool. But, you know, there are these they're, they're like tech companies. Mm-hmm. They're like medical tech companies. And why not? I want something that can heal. Let me have it in my house. Right. What? Right. I got to pay insurance and go to a hospital and get raked over the coals and basically work my whole life. And then maybe, you know, I'm stuck with an $80,000 mm. because I have Alzheimer's for 30, you know, 25 years and I have to, bro, Yeah. you got something in your head and maybe it's not going to be for sale for you, but your doctor, where you could go to your local yeah, doctor okay. yeah. and just sit down in the office and get this treatment. That would be, yeah. But maybe you could have it in your house. They're a priv- privately owned company. Right. Why not just sell it to people? I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, so 
So they ran small trials to ensure that the product was safe and produced synchronized brain rhythms in people. A randomized follow-up trial is ongoing in Denmark to see if the therapy can uh, ameliorate various aspects of Alzheimer's. Never read that word before. Hmm. Uh, but trial results could make two years, could take at least two years to materialize. Full regulatory approval could take even longer. And if we really, truly want to know how this technology is going to impact people's lives, they have to test it out in the real world. Get mm -hmm, it out there. Mm -hmm. um, the, an independent study also published in, in t today in Nature um, and by neuroimmunologist Jonathan Kippen Kipnis is, and his former colleague at Washington University's uh, further detail how rhythmic neuronal activity of of this kind induced by the 40 hertz therapy is critical to fluid perfusion and self-cleaning of the brain. Wow. Like they're literally calling it self-cleaning. Um, so the results are very convincing, says Andre Verzhenashkij. Boy, why? Bob. I think from now on, if there's a name in there that yeah. you don't aren't sure of, <laughs> just, just say Ro the, don't just say Ross Tyson. Ross just <laughs> You can just use my name. Says whatever. Ross Tyson, a neuroscientist at Boston University and one of the creators of the Owl's Life, an, an app that delivers gamma frequency stimulation alongside cognitive training exercises together. Ross Tyson says that the animal studies create a scientific foundation and a better understanding of what is changing in the brain. Uh, in addition to the Alzheimer's study, Cognito, uh, sorry, Cognito, plans to begin testing its device on people living with Parkinson's and multiple sclero sclerosis. Really? Um, they expect the therapy to prove beneficial gains of other conditions to autism, schizophrenia, strokes. So would they think that different frequencies of this would... Why not? Would, it, would like... They hey, could target certain, certain things. Yeah, could, sure. a certain frequency would target a certain thing. Sound That's is wild. literally the tip of the spear of yeah. the most important technology. AI... Sound is my top. Mm -hmm. AI is going to be a crazy... No. Sound technology is yeah, the tip yeah. of this. We which, don't know jack squat. Which, like we were talking about, I think, we, I think we were on air when we were talking about this earlier. Is this more so a full circle moment of us rediscovering sound technology? Oh, yeah. Of, you know, totally. Probably had this forever ago. Yes. It got lost. And yep. now our modern society is figuring out, hey, wait, there's a lot to the <clears> sound <throat> thing. And even energy. And I mean, that was a lot of what we talked about back when I was on the full episode yeah, with you guys originally. We talked a lot of energy yep. talk and stuff. And yep. I feel like that this, all of that stuff is branches of the same oh, same yeah. energy tree in that exactly. sense. Exactly. It's all vi vibrations. Mm -hmm. It's all harmonizing vibrations, sound, uh, frequencies. You know, you can tune a certain frequency, uh, you know, cymatics. And, you know, if it's what 432, it creates like a 27-pointed star. On a cymoscope. Yeah, or, yeah. Know. When you see all the, um, is that what those things are? Cymoscopes. Okay, yeah. so when when they have all the, I don't know, sand it's beads, sand, whatever it yeah. is, yeah, and mm -hmm. then you play a certain frequency and it literally produces a shape. Sacred like geometry. that is so cool. Yeah. Like, and you That's can't what, look at that and be like, that means nothing. Sending like, those frequencies into your brain. Mm -hmm. Oh, guess what? You don't have Alzheimer's anymore, which old is, man yeah. Ross. Which is wild. You and I'm like, thank goodness be... I invented this 35 years ago. <laughs> That's what I would say. On a, that was my idea on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They're like, Ross, you're cured. And I'm like, I remember when I started this. And they're like, he is cured. This is incredible. He remembers. This is so great. Oh, dude. Uh, yeah, it, it really is amazing. That's uh, wild. Um, and then, hey, kind of we'll let the cat out of the bag. Why not? Uh, so next week we have a great episode. The following week, since we're on the subject of sound, mm -hmm. we interviewed uh, Ricardo Calvario and Phil Corbett. They're one gentleman. Um, uh, Ricardo's from Portugal, and Phil is in uh, the U.K., and they're archaeoacoustics researchers. Oh. So they're at ancient sites rediscovering sound, measuring the sound, measuring the frequencies, measuring these weird um, sound chamber, the hypergeums. You ever heard of a hypergeum? I have. So they're studying hypergeums. That's cool. This, I don't want to get into too much of it. And that drops in you two You guys weeks? are going to freak out. Yes. That's this is probably cool. one of the most my most favorite episodes we've ever done because that's, that's awesome. like the wheelhouse of my wheelhouse mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sound ancient civilizations i yes. was so like oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh, uh 
I don't want to give away too much, but since we were on the subject, I would I thought I would um, keep an eye out for that, guys. Uh, Ricardo and Phil from the uh, Institute of Philosophy and Discovery. So, That's cool. Yeah, just came out with a research paper talking about all this. So, <clears throat> oh, Kyle, I don't think I stone. I don't think I grabbed that link. That one's next. One I was going to say, I was like, wait a second. Yeah, I don't know if I looked, this we, one we right. added this in and okay. I forgot okay. to click it. Uh, let me just hit that one real quick. NPR. Got it. Cool. Uh, so this is an NPR article. I don't know if you guys have heard about this Boeing situation, uh, this Boeing executive. Uh-uh. So it's pretty wild. We're, we're going to get into the article. Uh, let me hit refresh here real quick. Does this have anything? I, I see but, that it says over plane quality. Is this? <laughs> I have been seeing a lot of posts recently of planes falling apart in the air, and, every, and, and like this, everyone is like, "This is every it. plane I'm on." It's is falling happened apart. like two or three years ago. Okay. It happened again recently. Yeah, um, there was a big trial that happened. And we'll get into it. yes, Boeing is not doing great okay. as far as the quality of the products that they're putting out. And now they're getting massive amounts of heat. And this is a story that's similar to uh, Epstein didn't kill himself. That's yeah. what this okay. reminds me of. I mean, of. The, the title of this article yeah. does does uh, kind of descript us in that way. And I'm surprised it's not a major meme already on Twitter. Yeah. You know, we'll see. Right. Um, but Boeing whistleblower John Barnett, who raised alarm over plane quality, is found dead. Uh, this is from March 12th. Bill Chapel wrote this article. Police in Charleston, South Carolina, are investigating a death of John Barnett, a former Boeing quality control manager who became a whistleblower when he went public with his concerns about serious safety issues in the company's commercial airplanes. Barnett's body was found in a vehicle on a Holiday Inn parking lot in Charleston on Saturday. Police said one day earlier he testified in a deposition related to the string of problems he says he identified at Boeing's plant, where he once helped inspect a 787 Dreamliner aircraft before delivery for customers. Uh, Barnett was in very good spirits and really looking forward to. Didn't seem like a guy that wanted to off himself. This is what classic. we call the old classic situation yep. of being suicided. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. Uh, he was in very good spirits, um, he, he putting his the phase of his life, putting all this behind him. He's trying to move on. The South Carolina-based attorney said in a joint statement, we didn't see any indication he was would take his own life. No one can believe it. Police officer said, we were sent to the hotel to conduct a welfare check after people were in, in, able to contact Barnett, who had traveled to Charleston to testify in his lawsuit against Boeing. Upon their arrival, bro, Boeing? Giant mega corporation. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not going to. And also big, huge military contractor. You know, they get yeah. that Pentagon money, son. Right. You, you got to protect the interests of these mega corporations. How, you know, they can't. It's like Big Pharma, you know, the opiate epidemic. The Socklers for years yeah. tried to pre to prevent all those things from coming out until the the governor of, of uh, what was it, Maine, I think it was. You know, he got caught up taking money from the Sock. That's when the whole thing blew up mm -hmm. is when they realized that he was taking money from Sockler. That's when that whole case got real traction yeah and so you know here we go you know these whistleblowers they you know they end up their car just you know is driving 120 mile an hour down the road and it just crashes into a telephone pole or yeah. you know found dead with two gunshot wounds to the head in your car yeah yeah two right <laughs> Yeah. Gunshot wounds? Uh, no, uh, I, I, I knew him well. He was always a really sure guy. He always wanted to be sure, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's why there's two. Yeah, and he had a lot of brain function. He just put one in there just in case. Um, they, so upon their arrival, officers discovered a male inside a vehicle suffering from a gunshot wound to the head. Police said in the statement sent to NPR, he was pronounced deceased at the scene, clearly. The office of Charleston County Coroner Bobby Joe O'Neill said that Barnett, who had been living in his home state of Louisiana after retiring from Boeing, died from what appeared to be self-inflicted gunshot wound. Okay. Uh, Charleston police said detectives are actively investigating the case and are awaiting a formal cause of death as they try to determine the circumstances surrounding Barnett's death. Yeah, no. 
So Barnett 62 made international headlines. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, Barnett, who spent decades working for Boeing and its plants in Everett, Washington, and North Charleston, North Carolina, uh, sorry, North Charleston, South Carolina, he had repeatedly alleged that Boeing's manufacturing practices had declined and that rather than improve them, he added, managers had pressured workers not to document p- potential defects and problems. We're saddened by Mr. Barnett's passing and our thoughts are with his family and friends. Boeing said in a statement sent to NPR, uh, Barnett, 62, made international headlines in 2019 when he and another former Boeing employee spoke to the New York Times about what he called shoddy manufacturing problems at Boeing. Barnett accused the company of adopting a culture that prioritized numbers and profit over quality. Boy, by an extension, passenger safety went out the just went out the window. You're telling me a big corporation we only cares about the numbers and not the qua- hold we on. We can't we can't miss a There's day no or two way. of production. There's no day that's going to cost a day of production on those probably cost them 2-3 million dollars each day if they're behind. You got to deliver that plane, bud. <laughs> yeah. We got, you know, foreign governments are trying to buy. We got, uh, you know, the prince of Saudi Arabia is buying yeah. his own 747. Right. We got to get that out to him. We can't have safety concerns. If a door insane. flies open, people are the vacuum of the plane. Mm-hmm. I don't think it happens like it does in the movies where right. you just like get yeah, sucked of course. Out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, Stoner was talking about, you know, what was it, two, three years ago that, you know, the, or recently that the door just, the seal just came apart mm-hmm. and the, the door just came off. Mm-hmm. And some people got injured because, you know, there's stuff flying around. Right. You know, somebody's yeah. book bag comes flying up with a laptop in it yep. and just smacks you right in the head. So, you know, not cool. Um so as a quality manager at Boeing, he says, you're the last line of defense before a defect makes it out to the flying public. Barnett told the newspaper, and I haven't seen a plane out of Charleston yet that I'd put my name on it saying it's safe or airworthy. <laughs> By the time the article appeared, Barnett had already filed a whistleblower complaint against Boeing saying that his attempts to raise quality and safety problems had been ignored and that he was punished for continuing to flag them. I'm not, I'm not shocked at any of this. Nope. Barnett filed a whistleblower complaint against Boeing in early 2017. His case against the company was heading toward a trial in June, and his, uh, his family said he was looking forward to having his day in court and hoped it would be to force Boeing to change its culture. The family said in a statement shared with NPR by his brother, excuse me, Ronnie Barnett, the family says Barnett's health declined because of the stresses of taking a st- the stand against his longtime employer. He was suffering from PTSD and anxiety attacks as a result of being subjected to the hostile work environment at Boeing, they said, which they believe led to his death. Mm -hmm. You know, they were trying to say that about David Grush when Grush came out with the UFO reports, you know, saying that he had PTSD, couldn't be trusted, he's mentally ill. It's like, yeah, I was a soldier. Yeah. I had PTSD. The military paid for me to get treatment. I can't get to this level of clearance if they're never going to let, if I had real mental illness, which I worked through it, I'm good now. Mm -hmm. All the problems I've had, I've worked through, I've moved on. Yes, I had to seek treatment for PTSD. I watched tons of my friends die in the war. Right, right. So, you know, that's, they try to get you. Mm -hmm. They, the stigma of mental health, unfortunately, that doesn't work anymore. Yeah. People are way more aware of mental health. Like you can talk about depression, anxiety, and, you know, back in the day, it's like, oh, stop being a wuss, man. Just, you know, right. you just move on. Like right. nobody, uh, PTSD was called shell-shocked back in the day. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it's. Uh, yeah. I feel like this, uh, things that happen like this are the modern day, like burning of witches. Yeah. You know, any any girl back in the day who was yeah. slightly different, they were against, like, she's a witch. Against the church. Now I feel like. It, it's and against that's a funny comparison, but I, I do think that that's the modern day version it's, of it. When you yep. speak out against a large problem like that, Julian Assange, you're doing something like that. You're labeled as mentally unhealthy. Ed you're Snowden. you're mentally ill. Yep. You're crazy. They're insane. They had all these conspiracy. No, it's just a conspiracy. It's blah blah. blah. That's yeah. it's the same thing now, just on such a such a amplified scale because it's not the media. You know, it's not a girl in a in a village mm-hmm. being like. 
you know, whatever they would do that, that, that went against the village's beliefs that then they yeah. would be burning a stake for. Mm-hmm. Now it's, it's amplified to this like, hey, uh, I don't think you should, I think you should focus more on quality yeah. uh, rather than just running numbers and using us all as numbers and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, you end up in things like this. And, you know, I, I you're not making I'm, TVs. Right. You're making airplanes that hundred or so people fly in mm-hmm. every single day across oceans. Yep. And across massive bodies of water and land, and they're just, uh, I mean, it, it's its just criminal. And watch, nobody will go to jail. Yeah. Nobody no. will go to jail. No. Not, none of those executives running Boeing will get in any trouble at all. And Mark they, my words, I'd, it will not happen. Yeah, there's probably going to be no processes changed or... Nope. Or they'll just release a statement. They're like, we're adding one more layer of protection where we are going to take five extra minutes to look over our, our product. Yeah. And that'll be all it is. Yeah, so, you know, here it basically says that, yeah, it took an emotional, mental, and emotional toll because he's being, they're going after him. Yeah. So, of course, he's stressed out. Yeah, over naturally. You know, but yeah. a part of him coming out and doing the whistleblower, like, that's something that you're looking forward to. You're excited about moving on. I, d- I think, yeah, if you're stressed out because of how Boeing's treating you because you're trying to come out and tell him, hey, you need to. Mm-hmm. This quality is is garbage for years. Yeah, that's going to stress you out. Yeah. So why didn't he commit suicide back then? Yeah. He just exactly. right before his six month deposition, he waits to do it when he's that close to having it put behind him. Yep. Uh, I just don't think it makes yeah. any sense. And it and it sucks when you know something like this happens and it is turned into a bit oh. of a conspiracy and, <laughs> and unsolved mystery type of thing. But it's also it's like you can't not yeah. think that. When you're in the, you know what I mean? It's like, you can't not be like, well, okay, this is terrible that someone is now dead. But also now let's look at all the extra stuff around it. Oh, Oh, yeah. Well, how do we get there? Mm -hmm. There's an awful lot of weirdness around it. So I said 100 people. It's 200, 787 carries 288 passengers. Gotcha. Hello. I was way, way, way (laughs) off there. Um, And, you know... so they just got to wake up, man. Like, that's just... <sighs> but, you know, Boeing's got to... What other plane manufacturers are there? Yeah. Delta mm-hmm. in Southwest. Everybody owns Boeings. Mm-hmm. You know, what are the other companies out there? Yeah. If you get in a Delta or you take a Southwest flight, chances are you're in a Boeing. That's a problem with stuff like this, though, is like, I don't know what actually causes a change because whether whether it's a company like Boeing or any other large Corporation that yeah. makes any mass produced product and they're doing it with as low quality as possible to get as high turnover rate to get the numbers to get the money because yeah. it's all about the money. Yeah. It, what sucks is that, like, even if for the next three months a plane of theirs just disintegrated in the sky and yeah. tons of people died once a month for the next three months, I don't know if anything <laughs> would actually change still. Yeah. You know what I mean? I still feel like they would release the casual statement, send some money out to, to yeah. you know, make amends for it and then continue to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like when you know, when when a when a corporation or something like that gets as big and monopolized or whatever it is, there's there's that unfortunate uh dystopian part of it where they're like, "Oh, we're not we don't we don't have to change because yeah. why why would we? Exactly. We we have the money, we have the all the stuff. What's the reason? Mm-hmm. We're not empathy is long gone out the out the window. You're at just that a point. number, you're a you're a ticket your ticket yeah. price, your baggage fee, uh, you know, that's your yeah. dollars and cents. You're on a spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. You know, the, if you're not pl- flying private, you know, you're flying coat. You're just a peasant to them. Yeah. <laughs> you're not making, uh, you know, $280 million as an executive of, of Boeing. You're just, you know, you're a dude that's trying to get to a gig. Right. You know, you're trying to go fly to mm-hmm. shoot, a, shoot a movie or do a live stream. Yep. <laughs> you just so happen to get caught on the plane that ends up the door flying off mid-flight exactly and losing cabin pressure and almost flying can you imagine being the dude that sits in those seats i never pick those seats right you get more leg room i'm not that interested yeah maybe a little too much too much leg room if this door flies off (laughs) yeah yeah, i'm not trying to yeah (laughs) you got all the leg room in the world that's probably what they would frame that (laughs) as yeah. Like, uh, that's what they would do. Boeing would be if if yeah. a door flew off a plane, they'd be like, well, we're, "We're adding more leg room. That's all that is, right?" Yeah. We okay. are thinking of our customers. Born not to run says the Airbus is a big competitor. Okay, 
See, I've never even. I think I may have heard the the name. I know Boeing. Yeah, I don't I know do. Airbus. I, I don't well. know if Boeing's I've heard Airbus. kind of the main game in town. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have any competition, you know we're all going to be stuck in these garbage Boeing planes. Wild fun fact: uh, My very first job was working in an airplane parts factory. Oh, what? Where I worked on what? mega, mega small part uh, airplane parts. Maybe what? I'm part of the problem here. Maybe I because I didn't do a good enough job years what? ago on the parts. <laughs> They're now falling apart. Was this like a a high school job or a college? 19. I was like, yeah, Yeah, yeah. I was 19. I worked there for a year. It's just this, it's a, it's like the factory in my small town. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I got a job there and sat in a booth all day and grinded, found defections. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. In how, how these went into airplanes. You worked in a machine shop. I have no idea. My dad was a machinist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you're working in a machine shop. yeah. Machine trades. I couldn't tell you how any of these ended up in an airplane because looking at them, I'm like, this is, is a this? paperweight. I have no idea what this is. <laughs> but yeah, I would go in, find the defects, grind them out, and then if they couldn't be ground out, you would throw them away or whatever. Yeah, I'd like to down. think I did a good enough job to where I did not cause planes to fall apart. Yeah, I don't think you did. But, you know, we'll find out. But even that little place has quality control. You know? uh, yes. You know yes. what I mean? They're, they're, somebody's checking your work. Right. And even as a 19-year-old who hated that job, I still was like, I want to make sure I'm doing a good job at this. Like, Because yeah. if this does yeah. end up in an airplane, wherever it ends up, like, yeah. it could be a toilet piece for all I know. And that's I have this no guy. He's coming out and saying, hey, exactly. man, I'm on the ground here. That's what's wild. I'm responsible yeah. for this plant. Yep. I'm responsible for I'm the safety guy. You mm-hmm. hired me to be the safety guy. And then you're telling me, don't be the safety guy. Just be a guy and stay out of our way. Yeah. That's, yeah, insane. Just roll him out. Get him in the air. Let's go. Uh, this next article, single dose of LSD provides immediate and lasting relief from anxiety, study says. Uh, this is a CNN article, CNN Health by Sandy Lamott, uh, Lamate. And uh, so uh, this clinical trial encourages the results of U.S. Food and Drug Administration breakthrough therapy status for an LSD formulation to treat generalized anxiety disorder. Mind Med. Uh, Mind Medicine Inc. or MindMed announced Thursday the biopharmaceutical company is developing the drug. Uh, small disclosure: I've owned a little bit of stock in this company for about three years now. Really? Yes. That's cool. And it's been down. Okay. Majorly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> good. Good. Maybe not. It's so been good down. Uh, but you know, I, I, there's a couple other ones that I just was like, hey, I see this technology, I see what they're trying to do, and just mm-hmm. whatever. I mean, just, you know, yeah. let's just get a little piece of that. Okay. And it blew, dude. This study came out, that stock just went pow. It came back down to earth a little bit, but I mean, it's still up like 30, 35%. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So they're doing real well. And, um, you know, the CEO is a sharp guy, but these kind of companies are what's going to make psychedelics culturally accepted which would be very cool uh, yeah to be able to get things legalized for at least being able to uh you know go to some like you know what the the all the hospitals are all privately owned Mm -hmm. every medical office you go to are privately owned who's to say you can't go into a mind med facility and be administered this uh derivative of lsd it's not lsd lsd is way too hard to to i guess there's only like three people in the country that can synthesize lsd Really? Yeah, it's okay. very, very difficult. So they kind of created this formulation because it's much, much easier. It has a, a lot of the similar effects, and uh, it does the same thing, but mm-hmm. it's just easier to manufacture, and they can they can patent it. Right, right, um, right. So, <clears throat> so clinical trials encouraging the results won U.S. Food and Drug Administration breakthrough. Um, and so a breakthrough designation is uh, the recognition – that a uh, sorry the recognition that a drug has demonstrated evidence of clinical efficacy in a meeting an unmet medical need with morbidity and mortality associated with it says doctor I don't know what any of that means but Dr Daniel Carlin does who's assistant for professor of psychiatry at Tufts University School of Medicine and so MindMed the compound is called MM120. Okay. And it still has to go through FDA standard approval, including phase three trials. So th- this is just phase two. Gotcha. Um, they're, now they're getting the go-ahead from the FDA to go into phase three. Hmm. Um, so the designation is an offer from the agency to engage more closely in, a, in the drug development. And the new results on efficacy at, at 12 weeks, a single dose of MM120, which is lysergeride detartrate, 
led to a 48% rate of remission from generalized anxiety disorder at 12 weeks following the drug's administration, according to MindMed. Uh, the MM120 drug also significantly improves clinical signs of general anxiety disorder for 65% of patients. Wow. Not 20. That's cool. I mean, FDA approves psychotropic drugs uh, for at like 20, 30, 40. Per, like, oh, it's good enough. Dude, this huh. is like crazy. And, and you know, they're still figuring out dosage and right. all these. Th this is just the beginning. So you can really, you could probably get 65% way up. That's crazy. Eventually. That's cool. Um, and so anxiety, which is the most common mental disorder in the U.S., we all know that, uh, affecting over 40 million people at the age of 18 and older. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's a giant population. Yeah. Of America, there's only 350 million people in our in our country. Mm -hmm. uh, the multi-center randomized double-blinded trial tested doses of 25, 50, and 100 and 200 micrograms compared with a placebo. 200 mics is a lot. Yeah, you're, you're pretty hard. Like the the I think the the doses in the 60s were like 100 micrograms, which is too much. Yeah. That's too much. Yeah. That's a lot. That is, yeah. Yeah, that's what you were getting down in the hate ashbury of, <laughs> of just, you're getting, like, massively dosed. If somebody, yeah. So they're doing 200 microgram studies. That's that's a lot. Uh, Carlin, we're very c confident based on the results that 100 micrograms is the right dose to bring into phase three studies. A single dose produces enduring effects probable due to its breakdown of persistent negative thought processes. You just talk, stop talking shit to yourself. Yeah. It just yeah. says, hey, shows you to not do that. Wow. Reorganizes your brain chemistry to not want to do that. And, you know, the, w one of the cool thing is, is that it's not accomplished with the use of psychotherapy. Okay. So the, we've been talking about this with these DMT and ayahuasca researchers we've had on lately. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Giovanni. Uh, sorry, Gio Dorno from uh, he's he's in uh, Holland right now. He's an ayahuasca researcher, but that's what they're trying to do too. They're just trying to give them the dose mm -hmm. with no therapy and just say, what does it do? Yeah. yeah, what are these chemicals that are in it, and what are what are they're just there? They're doing it. There's no outside. Hey, if there's people to help you if you start freaking out or you mm -hmm. need to go to the bathroom. You need something, you know, there's, it's, yep. you're not on an island, but they're, they're not someone talking you through it and, you know, the therapy component. Right. And that's the first time I ever heard of that. Yeah. So that's what this, these guys are doing too. That's just to see cool. if it's just the drug that does it. Yeah. Yeah. That maybe you don't need psychotherapy. Yep. Even, but not to say that afterwards going through it, mm. maybe you could have a therapist talk through some stuff, um, but you may not need it. And that's what it kind of... These That's, researchers, yeah. we're learning a lot right now. Um, so it, prior research has documented the benefits of combining LSD with psychotherapy to relieve anxiety associated with life-threatening conditions. This effectively treats generalized anxiety without an adjunct of psychotherapy, said psychiatrist Dr. Gabrielle Gobi, a professor at McGill University. Uh, when, M <clears throat> when the MM120 clinical trial began in August of 2022, it marked the first time LSD had been studied in a medical setting in over 40 years, Carlin said. During the 1940s and 50s, tens of thousands of patients took LSD and other psychotropics to study their effects on cancer, anxiety, alcoholism, opioid use, disorder, uh, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Researchers began to see psychedelics as a possible new, new tool for shortening psychotherapy. But when Harvard University psychologists Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert got a little loose, uh, were fired from Harvard, the psilocybin project in 1963 after the university discovered they were dosing their grad students. Uh, in 1968, the United States outlawed LSD and research projects, but were shut down to force and forced underground. Then came the 1970s controlled act controlled substances act signed by president Richard Nixon. It classified all hallucinogens, including psilocybin and all schedule one drugs with no current accepted medical use. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, his head of his cabinet basically came out and said the whole, on his deathbed, 
said the whole reason the drug act ever went through was to go after the the uh, revolutionaries of the anti-war movement and the people that were fighting for civil rights. So the Black Panthers, the hippies, yeah. they wow. were going after the dr- and that's what he came out and said. Yeah, that's what this is never about drugs and protecting people of from. No, you know, no. And they they saw how beneficial the therapeutics were in the 1950s and they're like whoa 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 hey hey, we can't have people like you know getting better and have realize having realizations that war is bad exactly and that we shouldn't have tanks in other countries yep it's all about the control aspect yeah yep always Uh, always so this is kind of an <laughs> well, we're going to move on here because I really like this video <laughs> from Twitter or X rather. Uh, this post is from Massimo and uh, a disoriented bear high on hallucinogenic mad honey is rescued and taken to the vet in Turkey. Yeah, this is incredible. All that. Dude, he's not having a he's he's a huh. <laughs> this is one of those. Uh, <laughs> remember little oh, bear? Dude, he's just yeah. This yeah. is him now. Yeah, this right. Is, Look, do you see his breath he took? He went, <gasps> Yeah, he literally he's is having a hard time. He's focusing on his breath. He's like in a lotus position. Yeah, man, these child stars, they just grow up and this is what happens yeah, to them. Exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. You get a TV show like that for a long time and this is where you end up. Boy, Mad Honey. Yeah, I heard Mad Honey is not really like a trip that's all that pleasant. Really? Yeah. I've never uh, heard of Mad Honey yeah, until this video. It's it's Somehow, like the plants that they're getting the the honey from, mm-hmm. the the bees that are creating it, uh, have this psychedelic drug effect. And so, when they make the honey, it's this weird. It's very like you can. They sell it in these countries. Sell it for like quite a bit of money. Really, you can buy up the little jars. Of oh it. wow! It's, okay, yeah, and it's supposedly rough really like you don't want to take a lot to that bear he took i mean a lot. yeah he's look at him he's breathing he's literally turning <gasps> into an upset <gasps> human is what he's doing he's, he's literally like yeah the dude at the music festival that's in his lawn chair yeah oh god hey buddy you okay he i'm took- also not 100 percent convinced that's not just like a guy in a suit at yeah this point. it kind of so looks human. <laughs> literally the it way looks, he's sitting he's just right? like chilling in his chair <laughs> remember that uh wasn't there a video a couple months ago that came out of a bear at a zoo that people thought was a man in a suit did you see that video Oh, yeah. Where yeah, he stands yeah. up straight and yeah. you like his skin folds. And right. so people were like, that's a man in a suit. Yeah. And he's standing up very, very straight. Yeah. And, that's, you know, well, now we're seeing that bears can be humans, too. Right. As long as they're super, super high. Well, I mean, that's why Bigfoot gets, uh, you know, bears get because mm-hmm. they can stand up with their hind legs. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes there are bear sightings that are could be, you know, were Bigfoot sightings, but could be bears. Yeah, than, yeah. But I don't know. I think Bigfoot's definitely real. Maybe Bigfoot is just the wrong type of bear on the wrong type of honey, and they just start walking like that at some point. Yeah, it's like you know that's what? It. Enough they, of that they honey. They just start <laughs> from <laughs> eating mad honey. Yep. And they just became and like evolved. Because I mean, he looked pretty human to me, so I could see weird. him walking uh, very human like after that was enough of a high enough dose of that. <laughs> <laughs> Heather Lamb, you're hilarious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh and also shout out to heather lamb because i had to throw this article in here next uh it, we had uh, heather posted a, a a photo of a mound that was uh and heather you, you, where, wherever that was if you could put that in the chat that'd be awesome uh but the mound was completely surrounded in in civil war soldier and, and veterans uh or you know war soldiers basically veterans their graves are all around this whole mound. It's built this, we built a cemetery in this mound complex. Really? And there's all these veterans. And so she snapped a photo of the plaque and it's was previously run by the Odd Fellows. So the Odd Fellows are a secret society that goes back way, way far. Yeah. But you'll see their name on stuff around Ohio. You can go anywhere. You'll stumble across these weird Odd Fellow lodges. Like, who the hell are the Odd Fellows? Right, right. Well, they were super, super powerful in the 1800s at the height of the fraternal order. The Masons were real big. Um, you know, you had the Shriners. You had all these different groups. Um, so I found this, and we're just going to talk about this. This is from the Messy Nessie Chick and the Mysterious Order of the Odd Fellows that frankly belongs in a Wes and Anderson movie. Mm-hmm. And now I do have a buddy that's reluctant to come on and talk about Odd Fellows. Really? Yeah. 
I'm trying to get him to come on the show. In what relation he, does he have to so Oddfellows? The, the African American lodges of okay. the Odd Fellows. The history of those lodges is what he's kind of been focused on. Um, and uh, but you know he he's a little he did he doesn't want to talk about the okay. Odd. He's a little freaked out to talk about the Odd Fellows. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you know there are marks all over here in this city for sure. Um, and this is, like I said, MessyNessyChick.com. The Independent Order of the Odd Fellows, a secret society of odd people. Why, well, I'd never heard of it. Never one tourist of the pool of a promising rabbit hole. I would soon discover the international fraternity I accidentally stumbled upon had existed for centuries, possibly longer. And at one point during the American golden age of fraternalism, it grew larger than the Freemasons. Members like Charlie Chaplin, P.T. Barnum, Winston Churchill, Charles Lindbergh, Wyatt Earp, and Al Pinkerton of the famous Pinkerton Group. Uh, the historical details of its foundations went strangely undocumented before the 18th century, creating some of uncertainty about its name and origin. So the purpose originally, um, they, they do charities, they help the less fortunate, kind of like the Shriners. Uh, this, their symbol is the triple link, which means friendship, love, and truth. The order was formed by individuals who had odd careers or exercised unusual trades and naturally gravitated towards each other socially and professionally, likely evolving from medieval guilds to form an odd fellowship. So if you were like so an they, astronomer or yeah. maybe a dude that makes, you know. So these guys don't sound like they were all that bad, just mysterious. Is that or is there a twist coming up in the article? Yeah. There is one. There's, there's a lot of conspiracies about the odd. OK, guys. gotcha. Yeah, I was would, like, right now, this doesn't sound, you know, a bunch <clears throat> of just odd friends hanging out. Well, it's hard to track. Giving the charities. That's what they talk about, too. It's really hard to track the. They didn't even start keeping records of this fraternity until like the late 1700s. Hmm. So all the way back to Europe, there's some evidence that they were here way before America. And maybe, like they said, even going back to past medieval times, um, you know, uh, you know, maybe they're a spinoff from the Knights Templar, yeah. which became the Freemasons. Maybe some of the Templars ended up in, you know, some the weird obscure, ones. obscure little town in France. Yeah. And who knows? They don't have any record. That's cool. But the odd fellows okay. were able to blow up here, and it's all skull and bones symbolism, mm -hmm. which is weird because you know that's the skull and bones fraternal order of Yale University, which is where all the founding members of the CIA were from. Uh, Alan Dulles, George Bush, you know George Pres Prescott Bush, George Bush Senior's father, was the one that stole Ger Geronimo's skull. And brought it into the tomb, the secret society of, of the skull and bones. They had Geronimo's skull. It might still be in there. I didn't know any of this. Oh, Prescott Bush stole Geronimo's head, bro. That's a hundred percent. Yes. So those bonesmen, this is a lot of the same symbolism. They're, wow. That's why people think the Odd Fellows has this satanic aspect to it. But in the article, you know, they're, they, it's it's not satanic. It, it you know, the skull. We'll get into it. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> the, the founders of the first American Lodge in 1806 were three boat builders, a comedian, and a vocalist. Arguably, an unusual mix of niche professions. The oldest surviving record of an Odd Fellow Lodge. Uh, however, can be tracked back to minutes, to the minutes of a meeting at Lodge Number Nine in England, circa 1748. Number Nine implying that there must have been at least eight others before it. So eight other lodges before that, up to 1748. Uh, the names of several British pubs today suggest past affiliations with Odd Fellows. There has been some effort to trace the order's origins back to antiquity, linking it to the name of the odd ceremonies and signs used by the Roman emperors. At the height of the Golden Age of Fraternalism, when as much as 40% of the adult population in the United States alone was estimated to be a member of at least one fraternal order, the Order of the Odd Fellows is no longer stranger to the conspiracies and rumors of witchcraft and satanic worship that may not take place, may or may not take place behind closed doors. Of course. So some of the controversies police have, uh, have often been called to investigate multiple skeletons uh, discovered in hidden Odd Fellow lodges, which are used in secret society initiations. Like I said, Geronimo's head. Wow. 
uh, with skull and bones. In 2001, LA Times reported that the discovery of numerous Jane Doe skeletons at the Orders Fraternity Halls in recent years had sparked outrage and police investigations across the country, including Missouri, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, and Nebraska. That's why my buddy doesn't really want to come on and talk about this. Okay. There, he's discovered some creepy stuff, at least about what's going on in this city. Oh, man. See, that's even more reason to talk I about I know. This. But he's... Uh, I don't want to give who he is away yeah. here, but I'm, I'm working on him. Man. I'm working on him. That's wild. So a longtime odd fellow from New York revealed that the skeleton or skull and bones... Uh, that the skeleton or skull and bones is a symbol of mortality for the order. Mortality, but bones dead? How mortality? Mm. That's your when you're alive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that symbol's death. Right. That's the, that's the Bavarian Always. death cult. That's Always. Yeah. The Illuminati. You know, mm-hmm. that's all those death cults. That's from the Bavarian. You know, Transylvania. You got the whole line of all those secret societies from the Illuminati is a German Bavarian order that came here. Isaac Weishaupt. It came here in 1776 is Hmm. when the Illuminati came to America and Isaac Weishaupt, you know, established the first Illuminati order here in the United States. Wow. So these Bavarian death, that's the Bohemian Grove. Yeah. Yeah. That's all Bohemian, you know, skulls and owls, Moloch. And Baal, you know, mm-hmm. they have all these different, uh, you know, deities and, and symbolism. Um, and so over centuries, politics have also succeeded at dividing the order. In England, the Jacobean uprisings created a new and separate branches according to political loyalties. Following the American Revolution, the American order split from the British in the aftermath of the Civil War, it split again. The whites only order stayed in one camp in a new branch, open to people of any race in the other. James McCune Smith, the first African American to hold a medical degree and the first to run a pharmacy, was one of the leading members of the Grand United Order of the Odd Fellows in America that celebrated black pride long before the civil rights movement. Interestingly enough, the Order of the Oddfellows became the first national fraternity to accept both men and women. And when it formed the Daughters of Rebecca, Rebecca, that's R-E-B-E-K-H, that's an ancient mythology. Rebecca is always associated with Satanism and, and, you know, weird dark magic. And, you know, Lilith, Rebecca, these are all kind of... Yeah, it's just, it's weird. Interesting. <laughs> in 1851, Eleanor Roosevelt would later become a member. So the Roosevelts, uh, phew, I don't know if I can get into all that right now. Um, but the, you know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, right? Delano, part of his name, the, the Delano family, that's his mother's side of the family. They were opium runners. They were part of the Chinese connection. They were the ones that were pushing massive amounts of opium into and basically completely destroyed China's entire civilization. They were running it through the the India, uh, the British India Corporation and the Delanos. All those guys were smugglers. They were legal corporations. The biggest corporation in the in the world was the East India Company. They were opium dealers, bro. Wow. And the Delanos were part of that. So you have okay. some pretty heavy hitters that are a part of the the Odd Fellows. You know the the Roosevelts. They got an interesting past. You you can track back the, the Franklin Roosevelt's family, and it's it's very 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 interesting, uh, sketchy past. Uh, so the members of the Grand United Order of the Odd Fellows in America. Oh, sorry, I read that part. Um, the predominantly African American branches of the Odd Fellows also functioned alongside the female auxiliaries from 1850s known as the Household of Ruth. (sighs) That hits me again. Uh, Household of Ruth, which attracted nearly 100,000 members, including Georgia Dwell, the first female African-American physician. Uh, In 1922, the Oddfellows reported over 2,676,582 members, Ross. Uh, outnumbering the Freemasons, but then came to the Great Depression, 
People simply couldn't afford memberships, hmm. and the lodges closed. Now, the big thing that happened, bringing out the recovery and reform of the following depression, was the Roosevelt's government welfare programs, which the secret societies, the Shriners, you can go around Ohio, you see Masonic lodges are mm -hmm. completely abandoned. Mm -hmm. That's, those are the people that were taking care of, hey, you needed a surgery done? Your local Freemason lodge, they would raise money. The Shriners would raise money to help people and, you know, to give back. Because it's part of that karmatic wheel. They do a lot of good. Mm -hmm. But it's part of that, you know, you've got to give a certain percentage of your money to make a whole bunch more money. Mm -hmm. Or you have to help somebody to, you know, move forward your agenda. So they, the Shriners, I mean, children's hospitals, it's crazy how much the Shriners have done for, you know, medical institutions and hospitals. And Wild. So okay. welfare comes in and all these lodges, they just start closing down huh. because they're not needed anymore. That's the governments wild. now, instead of these, you know, secret kind of independent orders, you have the government got a lot bigger during that time. Yeah. Way bigger. The, gov the federal government should have never had that, like, to be... But we were... Something bad like that. Guess what? Oh, I hand over all my freedoms. Take mm -hmm. The government's going to take care of you. It's going to be okay. We're going to... Everybody's going to be on welfare. Not cool with that. Yeah. I'm not good with that. Smaller federal government. Um, so following the Great Depression, some fraternal orders and societies evolved into insurance companies. But the order... Can you imagine? Okay. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that either. Interesting twist. <laughs> but the Order of the Odd Fellows lost more than 20% of its membership. The IOOF now claims to have 600,000 active members in the United States with inter uh, international branches in 26 countries. Members of the fraternity combined are estimated in the millions worldwide. The IOOF now claims to have 600... Uh, I must have copied and pasted that twice. Sorry, guys. Um, so 600,000 members, still a lot of people. I mean, yeah, yeah. This also doesn't seem very secret by this uh, photo we're looking at. You're here. right. <laughs> Big sign out front literally yeah. tells you the day and the time they meet up. Right. Independent order of the odd right. fellows. Mondays you at 8. get in the door. Get in here. Yeah. Know that we're in here, though. That's what we want you to know. Yeah. Interesting. <clears throat> but I think there's one in uh, Locust Grove, like right down the road, little town in by Serpent Mountain. I think there's an odd fellow lodge right there. Hmm. There's nobody that... It's they're all abandoned. Yeah, yeah. Once you see one Masonic lodge or these weird little, uh, gosh, what the Elks lodges, the Moose lodges. There's all mm -hmm. these weird little fraternities, and you'll go into a little town. And you're like, what's this? I uh, I went to so in Cincinnati last last year, the year before. I can't remember. Um, <clears throat> visiting friends, there was like a little like outdoor festival happening on one of the streets, and we were walking around, and there were these people. Uh, enticing people to come into their their building with like free cotton candy and all this sort of stuff. So we're like, ah, you know what? We'll go get some. So we go into this building, and um, it's an old. The upstairs was an old Mason meeting place, mm -hmm. and the downstairs was like an old uh, like post office or something like that. And they were trying to you know get funding from the city to turn it into like a, a cool like venue space because yeah. again there was a theater upstairs. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they were wanting to repurpose it, which is why they were in there trying to get people to come in and check out the space and learn about the history and all that sort of stuff. So one, the downstairs was cool because I, uh, didn't know that old businesses used to have spy tunnels for the bosses. Mm. Did you know this? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Um, so I got to see one of those that the bosses would crawl through ventilation. Wow. Basically there'd be like a three foot or four foot thing so they where they spy would spy on their employees. So they could literally walk in a little vent tunnel, yeah. uh, die hard style up oh, into, yeah. <laughs> to overlook the the main floor of the workers so they could watch and see if they were actually doing their job or not. So that that one was fascinating. But more so, I bring this up to say, we went upstairs to the uh, Mason part of it. And uh, it was just so cool because it was, I mean, it was a basic old theater, yep. very cool in general. But they pointed and they were like, do you see that little... Uh, the little glass circle in the ceiling right there. And I was like, yeah, you know, what, is that like a light or something? They were like, no, that's an isolation chamber. What? And I was like, 
What? For yeah. meditation? No, for uh, or, hazing. Oh, my God. Yeah. Really? So they were like, yeah. So then they, they went into the whole history of Spill the beans. Masons going there. And they would have their meetings, but newer ones would have to go and spend X amount of time in this isolation uh, chamber in the uh, ceiling. And their only bit of, like, light or anything they could see was this little... Thing and uh, yeah, so then they they weren't supposed to take anybody upstairs, but I was showing enough interest in it that the dad who was there he was like, "We're not showing anybody else the upstairs where the where the VIP rooms are for the Masons, but do you want to go see it?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I do." Dude. So we went upstairs, and these old everything's like still as old as it used to be. Nothing had been modernized, which is very cool. And so we go up, and there's like what you would see in a very old timey movie, you know, just yeah. more decrepit. Old VIP rooms of like changing rooms and and sinks. Uh, there was an old, very very old safe, where he was like, that's where the people who were going in for the hazing would they would put all their stuff in the safe. Um, and then he was like, then he's like, there's a, he called it like a Hobbit door. Mm-hmm. He was like, there's a small Hobbit door built up into one of the walls, and they would climb up a ladder, and then that would lead into the isolation room. What? So of course we were looking at the VIP section and I was like, I don't really want to see that door. I got to get in that door. And he was <laughs> like, we can't get in it, but I can show it to you. So we went over and I, I had photos on my phone and everything. Cause I, I was just like, I want to document all this. This is cool. Um, and yeah, sure enough, we walked into another room and there's this That's probably, weird. I would say seven feet up on the wall. There's this little, probably two or three foot door, little wooden door. Um, and apparently that's where, that's where we would enter through, and and you'd go into the chamber. I, I wanted to see the room, oh, the isolation room, so bad. Me. I would have been like, all right, and, I gotta go because I'm gonna bug the hell out of yeah, this guy. And and he was he almost budged, and he was like, <clears throat> if we, he's like, I don't know where, because they they use you know whatever different ladder that you know modern ladder to get in there now or whatever. Yeah. He's like, I, I don't know where the ladder is right now. He's right. like, I, or he's like, I, I would honestly let you go up and they check it out. They probably had like a custom ladder built. And it just yeah, got I think lost back in yeah, yeah yeah back in the day, I'm sure it was a little wooden one that, that leaned up there. But uh, yeah, I was I was this close to getting to see what that Damn. isolation chamber in the ceiling was like. Um, but just hearing about it and seeing the door and seeing the little hole in the wall, that was enough for me to be like, all right, that's pretty cool. How typical that was to have those in those lodges. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I have no idea, but yeah, apparently it was a, it was a hazing thing with like no food. And I think they had to take their clothes off to go up there too. Man, Um, fraternities are strange. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. You got to get broken down before you, then they build you back up. Exactly. Now you're part of the fraternity. You're part of the order. Right. Uh, we're your brothers. Yeah, like yeah. The skull and bones, they, they make them lay in coffins. Mm, okay. And they cover you. They literally really cover you up inside wow. a catacomb. There's catacombs in, in the in the skull and bones headquarters. It's basically a crypt. I mean, yeah. you can look up the photos. There's That's other crazy. orders, too, but they, it looks like a cemetery. It's weird, the buildings that these are in. Um, but, yeah, you go in there, you tell them your deepest, darkest secrets, and then you lay in a coffin, and then when you come out, you're reborn. Hmm. And I can't remember who exposed those rituals, but uh, there's a great movie. I think it's Matt Damon. Uh, if you guys have ever seen The Good Shepherd with Matt Damon, yeah. uh, Robert De Niro, uh, but it's basically about the beginning of the CIA. Yeah. And okay. Matt Damon's in, it starts out when he's in college and uh, he's he's uh, skull and bones. He's in huh. a skull and bones that ceremony. I didn't know that. But yeah, go check out The Good Shepherds. It's a really weird movie, dude. Interesting. Yeah. It's a, it's the OSS that Matt Damon's like one of the first OSS members in the war. So he just disappears to the war for like 6 years. Mm-hmm. And he's like the guy on the ground that's basically doing counterintelligence, sowing propaganda Mm -hmm. in German territory and secretly, you know, swaying people's minds through just sending out a bunch of false information. Interesting. And then he's one of the top guys they tap to start the CIA. They're like, hey, we got to get, we got to keep this going. That's cool. Because the OSS was just established for the war. Mm -hmm. When the war was over, it was like, well, the OSS is gone. Nope. Hmm. Robert De Niro's character is like, we got to keep this going. So Matt Damon gets sucked into now the CIA. Yeah, The Good Shepherd's great. That's cool. 2006, yeah, I think it came out. Heard of it, but I've never seen it. <coughs> so good. A lot of big time, big time actors too. Um, well, we'll try to breeze through these. Uh, I think we're uh, yeah we've been we've been going. We have been yeah, we've been we talking couple, for a long we time. Got a couple more articles. To we have go. we have been talking for quite a while. <laughs> 
Um, I'm going to breeze through this one, folks. I'll keep uh, my side <laughs> tangents to it. I'll... And and Ross, I'm not trying to have you here for a three-hour podcast. You're, you're filling in for Bub. You're killing it. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not trying to take up all your night. I'm just going to give you some oohs and ahs from this side of the studio. There we here. go. Uh, this is uh, science, uh, sorry, businessinsider.com, Jenny McGrath. And uh, this is from February 28th. Scientists are building tunnels under South Dakota for a $3 billion dollar experiment that could solve some of the universe's grandest mysteries okay what are those mysteries exactly right nearly seven years ago crews started hauling 800,000 tons of rock out of a former gold mine near lead south Car- La- lead south dakota the three resulting in underground caverns that are 500 feet long and almost tall enough to hold a seven story building Estimated to cost at least $3 billion, the Project Dune Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. Dune 2 just came out. I hear it's fantastic. Yeah, apparently they've been Uh, documenting a lot of this stuff by judging (laughs) they got two movies out of it. Right, right, exactly. Uh, And is led by scientists at the U.S. Department of Energy's Fermilab. Oh, boy. That's probably a Stranger Things operation. (laughs) The the Department of Energy is weird. Uh, Eventually, each cavern will hold 17,500 tons of liquid argon to help Fermilab's physicists detect elusive particles known as neutrinos, a.k.a. the ghost particles. We've covered something like this before. It's basically, I, I swear think they're, they're building about. CERN 2 in here. Yeah, it, <clears throat> right. So these, that's right. We have covered something similar to this where they put these arrays. Oh, they have one in Alaska. And and then the conspiracy is, is that these these detection, these de- these arrays that are underneath the ground, they're receivers for neutrinos where they're studying the sun's rays and the particles, but it has to be way underground because they have to filter through the earth before mm. the, the scientific equipment can capture that the neutrino. So they bury these things. That's why they're way down in this ground. Okay. So they have one of these in Alaska, and the theory is, the conspiracy is, is that it actually can receive, but it can transmit particle waves as well and it can either move energy to manipulate the weather uh we're yeah. talking about a directed energy weapon you know That's, the, the okay. maui conspiracy of of maui being the wildfires that are all over you know these directed i don't put a lot of weight into that stuff mm-hmm. sometimes the maui one's really strange though i will admit that um, but you know, is that what we're looking at here? This is like some kind of yeah, another yeah. one of these weird harp. You know, harp is a big one in Alaska. Yeah, the one in in, uh, in Antarctica that they built dwarfs harp. You also just can't put in the title "Solve the Universe's Mysteries." That's that you can't, a little like, weird. <laughs> that's a little. Weird. Just, they're digging around to do some stuff. Give me that. And but it's also me uh, you know based off of the evil characters in the movie Stranger Things is the Department of Energy. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. They're the ones that rip the hole into the uh, the underground, the upside down, the upside and down yeah. world. Yeah. It's it's all a government. Yeah. What operation? kind of mysteries are we talking about here? Right. And so the sun creates, so the neutrinos are subatomic particles all around you, passing straight through you unnoticed. The sun creates, the, uh, when the sun creates them, the supernova make them. Even bananas produce neutrinos. If you hold your hand up, there are about 10 billion neutrinos from the sun going through your hand. Every second, physicist Mary B. Shy and a spokesperson for Dune told Business Insider, neutrinos are nicknamed ghost particles because they can lack an electric charge and therefore rarely interact with anything they come in contact with. This also makes them extremely difficult to study, yet scientists persist nonetheless because neutrinos may hold the key to unveiling the secrets of the universe from what happened just after the Big Bang and observing the birth of a black hole. Whoa. Interesting. Wow. And, I mean, look, that image is pretty cool. Of one of these arrays... The de- the detectors, yeah. Uh, studying a particle. If you could scroll down one there, Stoner. Yeah, that one there. So there you go. That's pretty interesting. Hmm. The accelerators will fire fire extremely powerful beam of neutrinos first through a detector at Fermilab. The beam will then travel underground 800 miles to the detectors at the South Dakota Stanford Underground Research Facility. Along the way, neutrinos will do something somewhat strange. There are three types of neutrinos. 
and the particles can switch back and forth between them, a phenomenon known as oscillation. One Fermilab scientist compared to a house cat transforming into a jaguar and then a tiger before returning to its original shape. That's strange. What? Tracking how the neutrinos change over such long distance between Illinois and South Dakota will help scientists understand these oscillations better by giving them a more complete view than Fermilab's current 500-mile NOVA experiment between Illinois and Minnesota. Dude, what? Oh, my Mm. God. Okay, doing all this in mile underground protects the delicate oscillating particles from the energetic cosmic rays uh, that showers the Earth's surface every second and could interfere with the data. So that's, again, why they have them all underground, because those neutrinos, they got to be... Like, make sure that there's nothing else energetic around. Mm -hmm. There's not, like, you know, some radio tower or, you know, affecting it. Yeah. So scientists hope to answer three main questions with Dune. What the universe is made up of matter instead of antimatter? What happens when star collapses? And do protons decay? Right after the Big Bang, matter matter and antimatter were created almost an equal amount, Bishai said, uh, but today... From what the scientists can tell, the universe is almost entirely entirely made up of matter. Why did we end up with the matter universe? Not an antimatter universe, she added. Dune's beam is designed to create both neutrinos and antineutrinos, the antimatter version uh, looking at the oscillations between each type helps scientists figure out what happened to all the antimatter. Where hmm. did it all go? Yeah. Again. We're pretty advanced scientists, but we can't really, you know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I have, yeah. I think about My that brain's stuff every night, <laughs> but I just, you know, not a lot I can give away here. Right, exactly. Um, okay, let's buzz through this one. This next one is uh, newsnation.com. Uh, Cold Heart, Pentagon UFO report feeble attempt at cover-up. The Pentagon report denies any e- evidence of UFOs or aliens. A whistleblower claims there are at least secret UFO retrieval programs. Uh, and then we got uh, the Pentagon has released a report saying, hey, no aliens here. Uh, and there's no cover-up. Didn't we there's just no cover-up. go through? Didn't we, haven't we just went through this? Th- that's the didn't thing. This, didn't just a bunch of things get declassified and there's people coming out like, hey, actually, you know, but there's the some weird stuff. the whole time, it, even though it's up in front of Congress, Congress is David Grush, these military guys, Ryan Graves, but the Pentagon the whole time, they're denying everything. Hmm. Even though the, the Tic Tac video and all these videos, and there's biologics now that they're yeah. saying is it, they have to... to come out with all this stuff yeah the pentagon's holding they're holding tight with their story they're never gonna admit right. even though they'll allow these they're just saying hey these aren't aliens there's oh, no cover-up not to deter us from getting through this article yep but a fascinating conspiracy that i have begun to enjoy Ooh. recently is the idea that uh the government will at some point um Fake an alien invasion. Oh yeah, to Pro- try Project and Blue then, Beam. Yeah, Project Blue Beam. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a fun one. But it's like it's a real fun. But, one. but right now we're sitting here and we're like, no, none of this. And then I'm like, all right, when are you gonna get to the real thing here? Mm-hmm. Like, when are you gonna? Right. They're never I guess the re- the real on. fake thing, I yeah. suppose. In that case. Well, you always wonder what happened to the twenty five trillion dollars that's not on the books. What are the you know the missing. Uh, what Donald Rumsfeld announced the day before 9-11 happened, mm-hmm. that there was like $1.2 trillion that they couldn't account for. Yeah. Where do you think that money goes, buddy? Yeah, yeah. Where do you think that money goes? Right. It goes into pl- Pentagon Black Ops, it, into deep programs, DARPA programs. Mm-hmm. You know, the, they're never they're going to protect their research. The, yeah. Even though, and does Congress even have the power to tell the Pentagon to right. release the biologics? Or Boeing or Lockheed Martin or any mm. of these companies that have craft potentially, yeah, which it seems yeah. like a lot of them do. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so I don't think anybody's surprised that the Pentagon is making an announcement like this, Coulter yeah. reveals. Uh, he said it's spoken to multiple people, including some inside uh, the alleged secret UFO retrieval program who aren't buying what he calls a feeble attempt at a cover-up. Gold Star far... Th- uh, his father arrested i'm sorry we know for a fact that the inspector general of the intelligence community 
that is the oversight body for the intelligence community, separately from the Pentagon, has made a determination that David Grush's complaints are credible and urgent, Coltart says. Coltart said uh, Dr. Sean Kirpak. Kirkpatrick, the report's author, had preconceived agenda going into the investigation and said he has spoken to members of a special secret advisory committee. Colt Hart calls those people the gatekeepers for the secret program. Hmm. Colt Hart pointed out that the people who occupy uh, or have occupied high-level roles in government have said reports of a secret program are true despite what the Pentagon has said. He also said that all domain anomaly research, uh, sorry, resolution officer, AARO, the office investigating UFO reports, did not have the authority to do a deep investigation and find the information that would have confirmed Grush's claims. Even the aerospace bosses who claims in the report that they've got no knowledge of extraterrestrial technology or reverse engineering programs, they haven't formally been put under the oath to ask, I was going to say, when is that happening? Yeah. Because they demanded uh, Marco Rubio, and I mean, you can put whatever weight behind what Marco Rubio says, but, right. you know, he was pretty clear that they wanted everybody to turn in their biologics, turn in your craft, turn in your crashed, you know, artifacts, whatever mm-hmm. you got. It could be archaeological artifacts that some of these guys have mm-hmm. from ancient crash crashes. Mm-hmm. And the, the the word on the street is they all got stuff, and they want them to disclose it. If right. they don't, and they find out they have it, then the Congress is what they're going to take action yeah. against these huge corporations right. in the Pentagon. I'll see it when I believe it. Um, I will see it when I believe it. Because boy, Grush came out the congressional hearings, and then it's just crickets. News yeah. Nation's the only group that's uh, media organization that's really staying up with it and, and keeping a lot of this stuff current. Mm-hmm. Um, when 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 was this? When was that? Uh, this was this recently just came out. Gotcha. Uh, okay. Let me see what uh, whatever. I think it's a pretty recent article. Um, but of course, of course, they're gonna be ah no, never mind. Nope. <laughs> All this stuff is happening, but nah. Yeah. Nope. Insane. Absolutely insane. It'll reach a point where it's all going to have to come out. Uh, I would They're assume. just holding on as long as they can. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And speaking of holding on as long as you can, I think it's time to pay th- put this baby to bed. We did. We, ha- we have been we here. We did it. We have been here. We, we have it. done the thing. We did the thing. We got many doctorates. We got PhDs. Yes. We talked about changing our brains. We talked about UFOs, bears getting high, <laughs> secret societies. <laughs> Dude, this is a good one. The articles were super, super killer. Yeah, uh, this is fun. And, and some of these articles are all inspired by you guys out there. Hey, Cryptid Hunters, what's happening? Uh, Jessica, what is up? Uh, we we got to get together and do an episode with the Cryptid Hunters uh, very soon. Um, I'll never forget the nec- the image Necro created for the crypto- Cryptid Hunters episode was her, her, Cryptid Hunters as a Bigfoot. And me and Bub writing in her kangaroo pouch. Amazing. It was so ridiculous. Incredible. <laughs> that might be the best image ever of all time from Necro. Coming on new Strange Road merch. Yeah. You soon. Oh, yeah. Was, yeah. We're going to team up. <laughs> uh, well, guys, this has been awesome. All of you out there, thank you for watching. All of you listening, thank you for listening. Make sure you sure you hit that like button subscribe and hit that notification bell uh you know share this if you guys like strange happenings you like what we're doing uh please go share you know send it to your friends your cousins whoever let's spread the word uh that discord channel is rocking uh the links in the description uh the facebook groups rocking you can find us at the strange road on all the social medias you guys know where to find us uh, i appreciate all you guys yes this was a great episode go check out burton cryptids of the corn the cryptid huntress uh who else we have in here uh the creators necromechanimal on instagram you guys rule um we have uh, you know a lot of people doing a lot of cool things and ross Yes. Tell us where we can find you. You can find me everywhere at Ross Tyson. Tyson is spelled T-H-E-I-S-E-N. I do a handful of different podcasts. You can find them all there. If you go find me somewhere at W-I-D-H pod at Ross Tyson, you'll find all the different things, all the short films, all the fun, spooky stuff I do as well. Yeah. 
all there. You do some great stuff. Go check Thank out you. Ross and all his art and everything he's got going on. Uh, the podcast. Uh, how many pod? You got like five podcasts now? Well, well working on five. We got <laughs> we got three. We got three up and running right now, uh, and we're working on a couple more. So awesome. Yeah. There'll be plenty that I'm begging people to go subscribe to yep. at some point. So by the time I next I come on the show again, I'll be like, hey, we're up to ten podcasts. Yeah, we got to, yeah. God, you're being Sim Triply level. Soon. Unless I'm taken out by a secret <laughs> society, so yeah. we'll find out. The Odd Fellows. We did an episode. <laughs> Could be your, Who knows? Could we might have undoing. We might have talked too much. Boeing and Oddfellows are going to team up, bring yeah. you down. Yeah, they're gonna, claiming you're a scientist. They're going to give me a. a they're <laughs> like, hey, you got a secret. You got a private jet flight. You want it in a giveaway? Oh boy. Yeah, free timeshare. Yeah, come check it out. It'd be oh, great, man. Guys, this is so much fun. Uh, yeah, I think. Hey, thank you to Stoner and Master Control once again. Uh, you know, Stoner the loner tonight, and you know, super safe travels for Bub on his way back from North Carolina. We missed you tonight. Uh, we know you're representing, uh, and it's been a really, really fun time. But we're gonna sign out, guys. Love, peace, and chicken grease. Yeah, bro. That was fun. <laughs>